the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. Welcome to Philosophers, explained by me, Stephen Hicks. This series covers major philosophers and core texts in philosophy, especially the great classics. From each, I've selected an excerpt, 40 minutes or so, no more than an hour, and our purpose is to do a close reading of an important work with the accompanying text. In this episode, we're turning to George Hegel's 1821 Philosophy of History. It started as a series of lectures. He developed several times, and it was published posthumously. Uh, Hegel became uh, one of the ruling philosophers of Germany in the 1800s, and his philosophy was to exert great influence on uh, German intellectual life, uh, German political life, and more broadly, the world for more than a century. Let's go to the text. What does it all mean? Let's turn to Hegel's philosophy of history. Uh, as he uh, indicates in his opening line, he's delivering a series of lectures. Subject of this course of lectures is the philosophical history of the world. Uh, does history have a meaning? Is it just a series of random events? Is it cyclical? Is it progressive? Is it uh, a, a story of decline? Uh, all of those are philosophical questions about the nature of history. Hegel presents us initially with a taxonomy of types of history, uh, starting from what he calls original history and then scaling out in generality and abstractness. So original history, reflective history, and then philosophical history, which is our uh, primary focus in this talk, and of course, Hegel's in the entire substantial book. First kind of history, original history is uh, descriptions of a fairly narrow particular point, things that uh, were observed by the person recording the history, whose descriptions are for the most part limited to deeds, events, and states of society, which they had before their eyes and whose spirit they shared. Now, second kind of history, more general, a reflective kind of history, as he puts it. It is a history whose mode of representation is not really confined by the limits of the time to which it relates. And he goes on then to give some examples. It might include, for example, the entire history of a people or a country or of the world, and so therefore they're, they're, they're in rather the, uh, the historian is not recording what's going on in, in around him or in his or her lifetime, but rather say is a Greek historian and is interested in the origins of the, of, of the Greeks or the place of the Greeks in the entire history of, of the world. Uh, it can also be, as Hegel in, uh, indicates, uh, by, by ter in terms of subject matter, so history of art, history of law, history of religion. So, but scaling out even further, we're considering all of uh, all, all peoples in all nations at all times and the history therein. There we're going to get closer to philosophical history with that level of generality and, and abstractness. The third kind of history, the philosophical, means nothing but the thoughtful consideration of it. Thought is indeed essential to humanity. It is this that distinguishes us from the brutes. So other organisms live, they go through their lives, they have various sorts of experiences, but they don't reflect on their experiences and, and they don't ask what do all of these experiences mean. That's what human beings do and to the extent that they do that more systematically and big picture than they are being humans, but also they are becoming philosophical human. In sensations, cognition, and intellection, in our instincts and volitions, as far as they are truly human, thought is an invariable element. So philosophy is thinking about everything, and it's thinking about thinking, and that reflectiveness is built into the enterprise, and we want to uh, apply that to all of human beings. Now, we then get a, a very broad set of metaphysical claims about the nature of the, the, the world or the reality within which human beings inhabit. The only thought which philosophy brings with it to the contemplation of history is the simple conception of reason. And then what is reason? And it's reason with a capital R. And in English translation, uh, often reason, reason with a capital R is a more generic 
a more general uh, and more philosophical understanding of reason in contrast to reason with a small r, which would be the reason or the reasoning of any particular individual at any particular time. So here we have then the metaphysical claim that reason is the sovereign of the world, that the history of the world therefore presents us with a rational process. And then we go on to uh, uh, have a number of other descriptive phrases about what this is uh, that we mean by reason, what it is for it to be the sovereign of the world and its relation to history. It is there proved by speculative cognition that reason, and this term may so here suffice us without investigating the relation sustained by the universe to the divine being, is substance as well as infinite power its own infinite material underlying all the natural and spiritual life which it originates, also as the original form, that which sets this material in motion. So basically, everything is reason, uh, reason understood as the substance of the universe, the form of the universe, and the, uh, the, the, the motivating uh, movement Right, or initial impetus and sustaining impetus of the universe's process. That is what we mean by reality. Reality is reason. More description of this. Uh, uh, while it is exclusively its own basis of existence and absolute final aim, it is also the energizing power realizing this aim, developing it not only in the phenomena of the natural, but also of the spiritual universe, the history of the world, that this idea or reason is the true, the eternal, the absolutely powerful essence, that it reveals itself in the world, that in that world nothing else is revealed but this and its honor and glory. Now, to try to out some, uh, try out rather some traditional labels here, Hegel is not accepting the view that there is a, say, a god or a divine being that is totally other and otherworldly in some other dimension that is completely opposite to this particular dimension of material world. Instead, there is a fusion of those two dimensions into a unity. And so while God speaks of uh, reality as a divine being. Later, he will speak of it as God, as having a person, as having purposes, intentions, and so forth. It is not at all dualistic. It is em imminent, and even stronger than imminent, it is constitutive. So you, we might say that uh, uh, Hegel is a kind of pantheist. Everything is God, and God is everything. All right, that serves as a an initial approximation. <clears throat> it is clear idea of reason is not already developed in our minds. In beginning the study of universal history, we should at least have the firm, unconquerable faith that reason does exist there, that the world of intelligence and conscious volition is not abandoned to chance, but must show itself in the light of the self-cognizant idea. So we don't start off knowing quite what this reason is. All of us have limited uh, particular understandings uh, full of lots of uh, omissions and unclarities and so on. And so this is going to be a developmental process. We as individuals uh, increase in our knowledge, increase in our self-awareness, increase in our philosophical comprehension of the universe. And that is also what the universe itself is doing. It's undergoing this self-realizing, self-cognizing process through its actions in the world. And so the world uh, described as rational, then, is to say there are reasons for why things happen. And this is stronger than just saying that the world is causal or cause and effect and that therefore there are patterns in the world. The cause and effect patterns are directed by reason and are the instantiations of, 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 of reason. So reason is a causal force. It's possible to have a causal universe, but without any purpose or intentionality or goals. And Hegel is saying it's not simply that. It does have intentions, purposes, and goals. And then, of course, this puts Hegel also at the opposite end of uh, any spectrum that says the universe is just random happenstance of events. There's no patterns or no overall intelligible order. So, Another description here, it is only an inference from the history of the world. 
its development, or sorry, that its development has been a rational process, that the history in question has constituted the rational necessary course of the world's spirit. That spirit, whose nature is always one and the same, but which unfolds this, its one nature in the phenomena of the world's existence. All right, now we'll notice in this next paragraph uh, that we've uh, uh, not only introduced uh, the idea of reason as having purposes and intentionality, and we've introduced the language of spirit, but we now introduce the language of providence and then also the language of God, making further connections here. We have next to notice that the rise of this idea, that reason directs the world in connection with a further application of it, well known to us in the form, namely, of the religious truth, that the world is not abandoned to chance and external contingent causes, but that a providence controls it. Skipping down a little bit. The truth, then, that a providence, that of God, presides over the events, the events of the world, consorts with the proposition in question. For pr divine providence is wisdom endowed with an infinite power which realizes its aim, the absolute rational design of the world. Reason is thought conditioning itself with perfect freedom. Okay, so... We have then uh, what might sound like a traditional religious view of the world. Everything is part of God's plan. and But one significant difference here is that God uh, is a rational being. He's not a whimsical kind of God. And God is also imminent, built into the world. There is no traditional duality of God uh, as, say, a pure spirit in the world as his opposite is some sort of a materialistic, physical sort of reality. We are trying to integrate those two. But to explain history is to depict the passions of mankind, the genius, the active powers that play their part on the great stage and providentially determine, uh, sorry, the providentially determined process. So no, that's a strong formulation there. It is a determined process. It's, there is a plan. It's going to happen and it's going to unfold the way it has to unfold, uh, which these constitutes what is generally called the plan of providence. Yet it, it is this very plan which is supposed to be concealed from our view, which it is deemed presumption even to, uh, to, uh, to wish to, to, uh, to recognize. So we do have uh, uh, the idea that somehow we're aware in some forms of traditional religion that God has a plan, but that God is a kind of mysterious biz, uh, be a being and his plan is not ever quite going to be revealed to us except for snippets here and there, and that God works in mysterious ways with its uh, suggestion. It's uh, pointless to try to understand God's plan and perhaps even a little bit presumptuous to raise questions about the nature of God. So Hegel is also not accepting that traditional form of religion. Pious persons are encouraged to recognize in particular circumstances something more than mere chance to acknowledge the guiding hand of God. This is the traditional view of religion. Uh, but these instances of providence, providential design are of a limited kind and concern the accomplishment of nothing more than the desires of the individual in question. So that uh, more limited, uh, uh, I'm reading God off in various signs and omens and particular things that are going on within my sphere of existence and perhaps uh, considering how those are I'm going to uh, have implications for my particular life. Hegel is saying that's not the proper way to conceptualize what real religion is going to be about. But the history of the world in the history of the world, the individuals we have to do with are peoples, totalities that are states. So we are collectivizing and generalizing. The history of the world is not uh, about individuals or even focused on individuals. It operates at a more collectivized and general uh, uh, level. It is whole peoples that are, get, are getting moved around and moving the providential plan forward. All right, I've implicitly uh, touched upon a prominent question of the day, namely that of the possibility of knowing God. And then more specifically, the doctrine that it is impossible to know 
God. And this, of course, uh, is one of the reasons why uh, uh, during the Enlightenment of the previous uh, century and a half or so, there has been an increasing amount of secularism, agnosticism, and increasing amounts of atheism, as uh, uh, God has come to seem, uh, according to many of the traditional defenses of God, as some sort of unknowable, unintelligible being, uh, an irrational being that requires some sort of magical or leap of faith types of cognitive process. And that's totally out of step with modern rational scientific uh, 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 quest to know the way the world is. And that, uh, that approach uh, has had, of course, traditional followers, but it's had more uh, uh, recent sophisticated followers, and it's worth pointing out that Hegel is in the next generation after Immanuel Kant, and Kant had signed on to a modified form of that view, saying that effect the way reality really is, noumenal reality as he called it, is something that is totally closed off to reason, completely unknowable to us, that reason is limited to knowing only uh, ph phenomena, never noumena, or, or only appearances, never ultimate reality. And so we simply cannot know as a matter of principle whether there is a being such as God out there. And if we are going to believe there's going to be some sort of a kind of act of faith that will be necessary in order to get there. So one person uh, Hegel rather has in mind here is, is, is God. But Hegel is then going to, uh, to differ here to say, look, our purpose is not just to worship God or to believe God on faith or even to love God. We should not merely love God. The prevalent dogma involves the denial of what is there said, that it is the spirit that leads us into truth knows all things, penetrates even into the deep things of the Godhead. While the divine being is thus placed even beyond our knowledge and outside the limit of all human beings, we have the convenient license of wandering as far as we list in the direction of our own fancy. So if we say that God is unknowable, then that's just going to open the door to all kinds of subjectivities and weird people doing weird sorts of things and so on. So Hegel wants to say, absolutely not. I have been unwilling to leave out of sight the connection between our thesis, that reason governs and has governed the world, and the question of the possibility of a knowledge of God. We want to be able to know God, and Hegel is going to assert that we can come to know God. God is ultimately reason operating in the world, and with our smaller scale reasons, we can have some glimpses, glimpses of the big reason that is, uh, is God and providence, and then, of course, with the aid of a philosophically read history, achieve ultimately that that knowledge. And so uh, Hegel goes on to say, God wishes no narrow-hearted souls or empty heads for his children, but those whose spirit is of itself indeed poor, but rich in the knowledge of him, and who regard this knowledge of God as the only valuable possession. So take that old-fashioned faith and mysticism types of people, and also take that more sophisticated Kantian philosopher types of people. All right, another big subject introduced here. Uh, our mode of treating the subject is in this aspect a theodicea, or, or a theodicy, uh, a way of justifying the ways of God. The rightness or the justice of God, the original Greek word dikas, and then theos, so what uh, is the rightness or justice of God, and how can we possibly understand that? So that the ill that is found in the world may be comprehended and the thinking spirit reconciled with the fact of the existence of evil. And here Hegel is taking up one of the huge problems for traditional religion uh, over the course of the previous uh, uh, you know, millennia, as long as thoughtful people have been thinking about religious issues. If we conceive of God as an infinite being, an infinitely perfect being, infinitely powerful, infinitely knowledgeable, infinitely good being who created the world, then it seems as a matter of rationality that the world that would be created by such a perfect being should be a perfect world. But when we actually look at the world, we all know we see all sorts of things that are ill about the world, sicknesses, 
problems, weaknesses, immoralities, outright evils, and so forth. And so then the question is, how could this world, with all of its disgusting evil and badness and, and, and imperfections, possibly be the creation of a perfect being? And uh, that, of course, argues an argument that has led many people to conclude, well, we have to take the world as it is, and so therefore we can't believe that there is any such infinitely perfect God. Uh, and then those on the other side who exerted a great deal of effort to try to square what seems to be a circle or to reconcile to reconcile a, con a contradiction here. And this is exactly the issue that Hegel is taking up. How can we justify the world that God has apparently created with what we take his being to be when it seems to be a contradiction. Now, one of the uh, ways that uh, uh, one can try to resolve the contradiction is to play around with the notion of God's infinity in various directions. You can say, for example, that God is all-knowing and that he is all good, but maybe he is not all powerful, maybe he's just very powerful. And there's another powerful force in, at work in the world, the forces of evil, the devil, Satan, and so forth. And so we should read the history of the world as a struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Now that solves the problem of evil, but at a price. The price is that you can't believe that God is all powerful anymore because a certain amount of the power is taken over by this this uh, this evil force. Of course, you can argue that God is an amoral being. He's just purely a being that created the world and uh, imposed a plan upon it and set the world off in motion, but he doesn't have a moral agenda built into the world per se. Now that then, of course, preserves God's omnipotence, it preserves his omniscience, but it gives up on his, uh, his benevolence or his goodness by turning him into a kind of you know, scientist, architect kind of God who doesn't have any particular moral agenda. Hegel is not going to take either of those two options. Instead, what he's going to do is deny God's omniscience, at least at the beginning. What he's going to argue is that just as all of us as human beings uh, 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 start off with a certain amount of power and, 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 and a certain a number of moral agendas and we try to realize our plans, in the course of doing so, we discover who we really are. And so we achieve increasing self-knowledge as we develop to maturity. And so what Hegel is going to argue is if we blow that up to cosmological proportions, we can see the universe as being God. All of the energy, all of the power, all of the actuality uh, of the world uh, and then God starts to uh, realize himself in the plan of the world, starts to actualize all of his uh, potential plan for the world, and in the course of that, he comes to fuller and fuller self-realization. And so he starts off with a limited amount of knowledge and is going to then uh, 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 increase in the amount of knowledge, ultimately achieving an ultimate kind of omniscience. So God is all-powerful and all-good. He is all, but on the cognitive side, that is the self-realization of God, that is to say, the universe. And history provides the evidence, philosophy provides the understanding of that evidence, and is one stage along the universe's self-realization of who and what it is. So, on the one hand, the ultimate design of the world must be perceived and on the other hand, the fact that this design has been actually realized in it and that evil has not been able permanently to assert a competing position. That's the problem we are going to solve. And then we put it uh, uh, even more starkly when we read history and realize just how many terrible, awful things have happened. This strong phrase, the slaughter bench of history. But even regarding history as the slaughter bench at which the happiness of peoples, the wisdom of states, and the virtue of individuals have been victimized, the question involuntarily arises, to what principle, to what final aim these enormous sacrifices have been offered. So rather than just saying, well, these people have all been slaughtered for no particular reason, there is a reason. And, uh, and as history goes along and we understand it, we come better to comprehend the reason for the slaughter bench 
of history, uh, 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 factuality, and then that will ultimately uh, provide a justification for for God's for the God's uh, God's plan. We have all along purposely eschewed moral reflections as a method method of rising from the scene of historical specialities to the general principles with which they or which they embody rather. So uh, the place of morality uh, uh, as we currently understand it is then going to be a very sensitive subject because uh, 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 it's tempting Hegel then wants to assert at our current state of knowledge to say it is clear that the world is uh, uh, not necessarily full of evil, but dominated by evil, and those evils are absolute, and there is no good reason for that. Instead, Hegel wants to put a bracket around those sorts of claims and say, if we can take a bigger picture on the nature of history, perhaps we can resolve those more limited uh, uh, moral kinds of claims. All right, so here's a, a statement of the thesis. What we call aim, or sorry, principle, aim, destiny, or the idea, uh, the nature and idea of spirit is something merely general and abstract. Principle, plan of existence, law is a hidden, undeveloped essence, which as such, however true, it, it's true in itself, is not completely real. So the plan, the ultimate justification for why, why history is going the way it's going is not yet completely real. It's an undeveloped essence, and so we need to bide our time uh, and, and go through the process before we reach any sort of final judgment. That uh, 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 undeveloped essence uh, needs to go through a process. A second element must be introduced in order to produce actuality, actuation, realization, whose motive power is the will, the activity of man in the widest sense. So we are the part of the activation of the, uh, of, of the universe. Uh, the history of the world begins with its general aim, the realization of the idea of spirit only in an implicit form. That is, as nature, a hidden, most profoundly hidden, unconscious instinct. And the whole process of history is directed to rendering this unconscious impulse a conscious one. Thus, vast conjuries of volitions, interests, and activities constitute the instruments and means of the world spirit for attaining its object, bringing it to consciousness and realize it. And this aim is none other than finding itself, coming to itself, and contemplating itself in concrete actuality. All right, now, we're all part of it, but even those uh, uh, those of us who have a glimmer of some sort of higher purpose of, of the universe and that we're playing a bigger role seldom uh, realize that very explicitly or very consistently uh, or even dedicate our lives to the consistent realization of it. Most of us uh, uh, do our part, but we do it on a relatively small scale, and Hegel next wants to introduce those special individuals uh, who are the special uh, instruments of God or, 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 or tools of divine providence for really uh, uh, ramping up and speeding along the process of God's coming to fully realize himself. And these are the individuals Hegel calls the world historical individuals. And these are going to be the individuals who have an outside, outsized rather impact on not only their generation, uh, 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 but also uh, all of the world and all of history and such that their names will redound to us across the generation. So he then indicates, for example, Caesar. Uh, Caesar, of course, he wants to say, had his personal goals, his personal ambitions, but really history was working through Caesar. Caesar was a vehicle for uh, world history or divine providence to accomplish something uh, the unification, for example, of Rome into a certain uh, into a certain form of organization, so that Rome could accomplish something that would move history along. And so, as he goes on to say, uh, it was not then his private gain merely, but an unconscious impulse that occasioned the accomplishment of that for which the time was ripe. Such are all great historical men in whose uh, whose own particular aims involve those large issues which are the will of the world spirit. 
Now, there's a variation uh, analogy that is worth thinking about here. If we think about traditional religious prophets, so God has a message for humanity uh, that he wants humans to act a certain way. And so what he will do is he will select certain individuals and use those individuals, prophets, as a mouthpiece for his message. Now, those individuals, of course, have their own personal lives, goals, ambitions, and so forth, but their function really in history is to serve as a mouthpiece for God, to communicate certain messages from God to the rest of humanity. What Hegel is offering is an action or or, 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 or uh, existential realization variation of that. So the world is ready to go on to some next stage, but it doesn't quite realize that, but all of the conditions are ripe, and what then uh, uh, divine providence does is selects a given individual and uses that individual as an action uh, tool in order to make history move to that next developmental stage. And they don't even realize it themselves. Such individuals had no consciousness of the general idea they were unfolding while prosecuting those aims of theirs. On the contrary, they were practical political men, but at the same time, they were thinking men who had an insight into the requirements of the time, what was ripe for development. And then an interesting argument to, uh, uh, or a point that uh, uh, Hegel adds to his argument here is that one, uh, you read this as a piece of evidence, that it is the history, the, the fate of most of these world historical men that they don't live very long lives, uh, so that uh, they live, they perform their world historical function, and then, so to speak, since history has used them, it discards them. It doesn't need them anymore, and so they so they die. If we go on to cast a look at the fate of these world historical persons, whose vocation it was to be the agents of the world spirit, we shall find it to have been no happy one. When their object is attained, they fall off like empty holes from a kernel. They die early, like Alexander. They are murdered, like Caesar, transported to St. Helena, like Napoleon. And so the idea then is that it's not uh, their purpose in life to fulfill their own personal aims and agenda. Of course, they are trying to do that from their own uh, personal perspective on what their life is about, but at the same time, unknown to them, and more importantly, they are really being used by the world historical forces, and once so used, once that aim has been accomplished, they get set aside. Just a quick uh, note in here about envy. Uh, Hegel goes on to have an interesting discussion about envy, and uh, those rest of us who are not world historical individuals, uh, and that's the vast majority of people, and the common phenomenon of why we feel a resentment or an envy in many cases with respect to these uh, 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 great individuals. And there's just this passing line, uh, uh, that's often quoted, so it's worth highlighting it here. No man is a hero to his valet de chambre uh, from, uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from many people here. And then as he adds, but not because the former is no hero, but because the latter is a valet. All right, now one more uh, important line here about the world historical individuals. A world historical individual is not so unwise as to indulge a variety of wishes to divide his regards. He is devoted to the one aim regardless of all else. So these are incredibly focused individuals. They're not dilettantes. They don't spread themselves too thinly. They are obsessed with achieving one aim. And of course, it's their personal goal, but more importantly, that personal goal is embedded in a world historical goal that must be achieved. Again, we raise the question of morality, uh, because we know that <laughs> these uh, world historical individuals, more than any others, are, 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 are agents of the great slaughter bench of history. So what do we need to think about all of the thousands or millions of people who get uh, their lives destroyed as a result of these one uh, uh, these world historical individuals. It is even possible that such men may treat other great, even sacred interests, inconsiderately, conduct which is indeed obnoxious to moral reprehension. But so mighty a form must trample down many an innocent flower, crush to pieces many an object in 
its path. So this is just the way history goes. Uh, in order for history to advance, these terrible things have to happen. And again, we have a strong suggestion here that if we are going to try to raise kind of merely limited moral objections, but you know, look at my, my child here whom I love, uh, your world historical individual just killed my, killed my child. That's an evil thing. Hegel seems to be saying, well, not so fast. You're just speaking from your, your limited perspective, from the world historical perspective. These things have to happen. And again, if you stick with me and we get to the biggest, a bigger picture, you'll have a, uh, a theodicy justification, so to speak, for it. All right, this may be called the cunning of reason, that it sets the passions to work for itself while that which develops its existence through such impulsion pays the penalty and suffers loss. Reason uses us, we pay the price uh, in order to advance reason's purposes. The particular is for the most part of too trifling a value as compared with the general. The individuals are sacrificed and abandoned. So individuality uh, is not very important, as Hegel had suggested er uh, earlier. We're operating at the level of peoples, at the level of nations. That's the proper uh, value framework. Uh, individuals are means to an end of their peoples, end of their nations, and all of them more broadly of, uh, of, uh, of world history as, as well. So sacrifice individuals, but that's just a, uh, that's just a trifling value from his perspective. But though we might tolerate the idea that individuals, their desires and the gratification of them are thus sacrificed and their happiness given up to the empire of chance to which it belongs, that as a general rule, individuals come under the category of means to an ulterior end. And so then he goes on to say, any moral codes that prize individuality, any uh, ethical systems, any religions that say the individual is of sacred value uh, 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 and, and an end in himself or an end in his, herself, Hegel is saying, all of those moral codes, ethical codes, religious doctrines are wrong. We are collectivized and world historical in our value framework. Okay, I'm going to uh, jump on. Uh, so <clears throat> what we then need to do is avoid what Hegel calls the litany of lamentations, where we are good people, we are pious people, uh, and we're concerned with our individual characters and being virtuous and, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we find that we're not going to be very successful in the world because world historical individuals of various sorts just chew us up in achieving their sorts of ends. And then that leads us in our own personal philosophies to be to be uh, uh, not, not necessarily skeptical or even cynical, but sad and pessimistic about the nature of, of, of world history. And so we just say the world is a terrible place and we have this litany of lamentations that we engage with and so on. Hegel wants to say that also then is a faulty philosophy to arrive at. For the fancies which the individual in his isolation indulges cannot be the model for universal reality, just as universal law is not designed for the units of the mass. These as such may in fact find their interests decidedly thrust into the background. Get away from the level of concern for the individual, uh, their dreams, hopes, characters, purposes, lives even. We need to get up to the level of the collectivity and that's the right level at which to evaluate all of these things. We thrust the individual into the background. All right, so all of those kinds of criticisms of the process Hegel is then going to just reject. Instead, what we need to realize this is the right perspective is to say this good this reason is the most concrete, or in its most concrete form, is God, right? This is God's plan for the universe. And we're not operating at the level of individuals uh, and the individual's concerns. Instead, the vehicle that God uses, aside from the world historical individuals, as he goes on to say, is the actual working of his government. The carrying out of his plan is the history of the world. Philosophy wishes to discover the substantial purpose, the real side of the divine idea, and to justify the so much despised reality of things. For reason is the comprehension of 
the divine work, and then ending this paragraph, the claim of the world spirit rises above all special claims. So don't bring your special particular claims about your individuality, those you care about, personal character, virtue, and, and so on. Uh, the claims of the world spirit are, are higher. All right, now we are in transition to the vehicle, uh, uh, aside from the world historical individuals whom we've discussed, and, and uh, now we're going to focus on the state and the role of the state and entering explicitly into political philosophy. The essential, uh, this essential being is the union of the subjective with the rational will. It is the moral whole, the state, which is that form of reality in which the individual has and enjoys freedom, but on the condition of his recognition, believing in and willing that which is common to the whole. And this must not be understood as if the subjective will of the social unit attained its gratification and enjoyment through that common will. All right, so what Hegel here is doing is rejecting all forms of individualism. Uh, we've seen moral individualism rejected, religious individualism rejected, and uh, now we are going to be rejecting political individualism. And any form of liberalism that says that it's the liberty of the individual, the individual will, the pursuit of the individual dreams and happiness, that's what the state should be concerned with protecting the rights of individuals to go about those business, their business as they see fit. Hegel is rejecting all of that. Rather, we affirm that uh, our law, morality, government, and they alone, the positive reality and completion of freedom. Freedom of a low and limited order is mere caprice. Let's pause there, by which he means low and limited, that's you as an individual, and doing what you feel like, uh, doing whatever your subjective will is, that's just caprice. That's, that's wrong, that is to be dismissed, which finds its uh, exercise in the sphere of particular and limited desires. Instead, it's going to be the state or the, 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 the government, the particular government as the vehicle of, of the state in general, that's going to be the true embodiment, the right level at which history moves, and it's that level at which you, as an individual, find your true self or your true realization. The state, as he goes on to say, is the actually existing realized moral life. For it, it is the unity of the universal, essential will with that of the individual, and this is morality. The individual living in this unity has a moral life, possesses a value that consists in this substantiality alone. So it's to the extent that you uh, submerge yourself or become unified with the state, not you as an individual with your own life and goals to leave, but rather you as part of a collectivized set of individuals merging uh, in state action. That is the proper moral realization. It must further be understood that all the worth which the human being possesses, all spiritual reality he possesses only through the state and then a merger of uh, uh, the individual with the collective as realized in the state, that is your true worth or where your true worth is to be found. We then connect that with religion. The state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. For the morality of the state is not that of the that ethical reflective kind in which one's own conviction bears sway. This latter is rather the peculiarity of the modern time, pausing right there. So here we want to say, well, what should the will of the state be? And liberal individualists will say, well, each individual will have his own interests and goals and his freedoms, and, 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 and what we then should do is uh, come together and, and vote, or in the legislative assembly, uh, 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 have everybody express their convictions, and out of that we will find out what the will of the people is going to be, but it's going to be an individualized expression of it. Hegel is saying that is the wrong way of, of doing it. It's not one's own conviction. That's a peculiarity of uh, kind of modern liberal individualism. Instead, while the true antique morality is based on the principle of abiding 
by one's duty to the state at large. But morality is duty, substantial right, a second nature, as it has been called, for the first nature of man is primarily merely animal existence. And so we need to rise to accept, internalize, and act in concert with the idea of the state. All right, freedom as the ideal, and so what do we mean by freedom, uh, which is original and natural, does not exist as original and natural. Interestingly, we, so we don't start off with all of those state of nature doctrines, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and so forth, in a state of freedom. Instead, freedom is acquired once we uh, enter into state-run society and, uh, and, and, and have realized our moral duties only in that particular context. Rather, it must first be sought out and won, and that by an incalculable more medical di medial discipline of the intellectual and moral powers. The state of nature, therefore, predominantly that of injustice and violence of untamed natural impulses of inhuman deeds and females. Limitation is certainly produced by society and the state, but it is going to be the society and the state that are the very conditions in which freedom is realized. And by freedom, we mean your real freedom once you have uh, set aside your individual will and your individual pursuit of happiness and done your duty at the collectivized state level. Now, this is then not necessarily going to be particularly democratic. Uh, we go on to argue here, it is a dangerous and false prejudice that the people alone have reason and insight and know what justice is. So one kind of, uh, of bringing people together in groups is to say, well, let's do it democratically. Everybody will think for himself or herself. We'll get together and vote. And whatever prevails in the vote, that's going to be the will of the people for a certain amount of, of time. But Hegel wants to argue the vast majority of people don't have reason, they don't have insight, they don't know what justice, justice is. So that kind of procedure for finding out what the real will of the people is, in, uh, is misguided, uh, to say it minimally. The question as to what constitutes the states is one of advanced science and not of popular decision. And so, so it's only going to be the most philosophically insightful and educated people who really know what the state should be doing and what the genuine will of the people is. And it's not going to be through popular democratic purposes as well. It is to the state, therefore, that changes in the aspect of history indissolubly, uh, indissolubly attaches itself. It's the job of the state to move history forward, not individuals doing whatever it is that they want to do. Now, religion, of course, has been uh, a recurring theme, and we, uh, we come here to a, a, a discussion of religion now in a political context, Hegel uh, lecturing and writing in the early 1800s. This is, of course, an era in which the separation of religion and politics, separation of church and state, has been a strongly uh, uh, the, the dominant political idea. Religious pluralism, religious tolerance, and then formal separations of church and state in, uh, in more modern constitutions. And what we'll find is Hegel is going to reject any such separation of church and state, religion and state. Uh, religion uh, needs to be part of the political apparatus uh, and, and is an essential tool for advancing the state's goals. So among the forms of this conscious union, religion occupies the highest position. In it, that is to say in religion, spirit rising above the limitations of temporal and secular existence becomes conscious of the absolute spirit and in this consciousness of the self-existent being, renounces its individual interest. So true religion uh, involves the individual renouncing his individuality and coming to realize the, uh, the higher consciousness of the absolute spirit and identifying with it. Uh, uh, it lays this aside in devotion, a state of mind in which it refuses to occupy itself any longer with the limited and particular. By sacrifice, man expresses his renunciation of his property, his will, his individual 
feelings. So that pure selflessness and sacrifice of self, renunciation of individuality, that is then the true essence of religion. But man must also attain a conscious realization of this, his spirit, and his essential nature, and of his original identity with it. For as we have where we said that morality is the identity of the subjective or personal with the universal will, now the mind must give itself an expression, uh, give itself an express consciousness of this, and the focus of this knowledge is religion. So we must be religious in our personal agenda and our ultimately collective uh, uh, agenda. Uh, and it's going to be the thing that re leads us to renounce our, renou renounce rather our particular and our individuality, to realize the, uh, to realize the higher and the more general, and that then is going to put us in a position to, uh, religion rather, true religion, to put us in a position to perform our political function as decided by the state. So this conclusion then is drawn explicitly. In this aspect, religion stands in the closest connection with the political principle. It's a close connection between religion and politics, not a separation of religion and politics. Freedom can exist only where individuality is recognized as leaving its positive and real existence in the divine being. On this account, it is that the state rests on religion. And this theme is, uh, is absolutely uh, uh, essential and repeated several times. Uh, uh, no separation of certain church and state, rather the absolute integration of church and state. While, however, the correct sentiment is adopted that the state is based on religion, the position thus assigned to the re religion supposes that the state already to exist, and that subsequently, in order to maintain it, religion must be brought into it, buckets and bushel, bushels, as it were, and impressed upon people's hearts. So it has to be an active part of state policy to uh, use religion, to uh, lots of religion, constant religion for the vast majority of people who are not quite at the fully conscious level to bring them to the right state of moral being, the right state of, uh, of political being, so that they can be used uh, uh, for the state's purposes, which are ultimately world history's purposes, which are ultimately God's purposes. Philosophy concerns itself only with the glory of the idea mirroring itself in the history of the world. And thus we reach the conclusion of this introductory section to the philosophy of history. That the history of the world, with all the changing scenes which its annals present, is this process of development and the realization of spirit. This is the true theodicea, the justification of God in history. Only this insight can reconcile spirit with the history of the world, namely that what has happened and is happening every day is not only not without God, but is essentially his work.